You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No more hangers. Welcome to a very special Vintage Video Patreon pick, where our patrons at the $100 tier are invited to request any pre-80s title they'd like for a custom review from the Vintage Video team, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today, Carlos Moda has asked us to review The Time Machine, released August 3rd, 1960. It was written by David Duncan and H.G. Wells, directed by George Powell, and released by Loeb's. In 1895, one of science fiction author H.G. Wells' best-known works, The Time Machine, was published. Wells is often credited with originating the concept of a vehicle used to travel through time. In most or all previous stories, the time traveler is sent independently of a vehicle, and often without control, as in the case of Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, published six years prior. Animator-turned-director George Powell was approached by Shiro Kido, on behalf of Shochiko Productions to produce a Japanese adaptation of Wells's novel, but when the project fell apart, Powell brought the concept to MGM. The production lasted only a month for under a million dollars. Powell originally considered Paul Schofield for the lead character, but later switched to the more athletic Rod Taylor, though consideration was also given to David Niven and James Mason for the part. I would have liked either of those as well. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. that would have been fine. Yvette Mimieu was another top choice of pals, but MGM and even Rod Taylor advised against the inexperienced actress. Taylor specifically suggested Shirley Knight in Mimieu's place, but again, Powell got his way. Because Mimieu had lied about her age, she could not legally shoot full days, and as she got better at acting over the course of the production, reshoots of her earliest scenes were added back to the end of the schedule for shooting. Bill Ferrari was hired to design the titular prop, which he envisioned as a sled with an attached clock that would spin to indicate its motion through time. Pal had initially asked for the wheel to spin clockwise to the future and counterclockwise to the past, but the finished product could only spin one direction. The film made a paltry profit of around a quarter million dollars in North America, but Gene Warren and Tim Barr took home the 1961 Academy Award for Best Special Effects. The film has been followed since by a pair of TV movie adaptations and a 2002 remake directed by H.G. Wells' great-grandson, Simon Wells, with uncredited work from Gore Verbinski. Specific references to this film's time machine have been made by Quantum Leap, The Big Bang Theory, and even Regular Show. But a particularly amusing gag shows up in the back of Joe Dante's Gremlins when Hoyt Axton's Randall Peltzer calls his wife from a convention floor and we see a man climb into a replica prop of the 1960 time machine and then in the next shot the man has simply vanished. (laughs) With the time machine. The full-size time machine prop was sold at auction in the early 70s but wound up in a thrift store five years later where film historian Bob Burns found and restored the prop. Sadly, the miniature prop lived with George Powell until it was destroyed in a house fire. Oh. Oh. Too bad. I hope he had the box too, though. Like the velvet lined cushion box. Oh, yeah, that'd be box. cool. Powell pitched several sequels to MGM, but all were rejected by the studio. We open with various timepieces floating through a void in appropriately chronological order. A sundial, an hourglass, a pocket watch, and then just a weird statue of babies holding a ball. Is that a clock? That's, that's the next <laughs> the version of The clock of the clock. future. Yeah, exactly. That's the new Apple Watch. You know like, how to read that. It's like the three seashells in the bathroom. <laughs> that would be neat if there wasn't an, an Apple Watch floating through this 1960 film. We finish up with a lot of standard clocks and even a quick angle on Big Ben. Lightning flashes and we cut to a title card and then we see the opening credits as the fast changing seasons blow by behind them. Petals, rain, leaves, snow, over and over and over. We start the story on a man named Mr. Philby, played by Alan Young, stepping out the door of the department store he owns and crossing the street to the home of an inventor friend. He is welcomed inside by the maid, Mrs. Watchett, and takes a seat at a table with three fancily dressed gentlemen. A herd of clocks all chime at once around them to herald the arrival of their host, Mr. H. George Wells. When he still doesn't show up, the fancier guests get impatient, but Philby speaks to the man's defense, and right away, it should be clear to any DuckTales fans exactly who Alan Young is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I say it's outright rude of the man. He's merely being detained, that's all. 
Watch It appears from the kitchen with a note from Mr. Wells inviting the men to begin their meal promptly at 8 whether he has arrived or not. Just as they take their seats at the dinner table and raise a toast to Watch It's cooking, Wells stumbles in looking like a cartoon whose dynamite stick just exploded. <laughs> he sits down at the table with them and tries to share his story, but he's grappling with the events in his head. I've got to tell it now, David, while I still remember it. Relax. Try to relax. You have all the time in the world. <laughs> world. He begins his story quite illogically by describing their shared experience one week earlier on New Year's <laughs> Eve, 1899. We dissolve to the date in question, and Wells is sharing his incredible invention with the same group of investors. When he mentions his creation has to do with time, they all assume it's some revolutionary clock. Only Philby knows that a timepiece is beneath Wells' abilities. Mm. Is it a walking clock? <laughs> a walk-in clock? <laughs> you walk into it, and then you can see the time, and you walk back out. It's like a clock booth. <laughs> I don't think George is referring to a new type of timepiece. No, David. When I speak of time, gentlemen, I'm referring to the fourth dimension. Philby asks for a reminder on the first three, and the other men poke fun at him for being uneducated. We get our Mr. DNA moment explaining the dimensions of space. Sorta. He doesn't do a great no, job. No, it's not right? terrific. And, but, you know, and so my question here is this... I want to know how closely this correlates to the book. Very closely. Okay, because I was like, is this our understanding of the dimensions when this movie was made or when the book was written? Because I really hope that it's there, when the book was you're written. You're saying because there are more spatial dimensions? <laughs> well, the, the way they describe it is is not really accurate. No. Yeah, I, I have a couple problems here with the time travel, but that's what time travel movies well, are Well, not, not just the time travel itself, but like even just describing what the dimensions are. Right. Wells explains that we ignore the fourth dimension, time, because we cannot move through it as we please in either direction. We are locked into it. The futures... Well, or it moves through us. Oh. This is a debate, right? You also can't move through three dimensions at will because sometimes there's a wall. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, Richard. <laughs> well, the future's already there. It's irrevocable and cannot be changed. I wonder... You know, that's the most important question to which I hope to find an answer. Can man control his destiny? Can he change the shape of things to come? No. I don't know. This this movie doesn't delve into it because he never does anything that would negate something that happened later in right. this film. Yeah, but that's one of the things I like about it. Yeah. And we'll get to, I'll, get, we'll get, I'll save that for later, but. The Shape of Things to Come is also another of H.G. Wells's future history novels, itself adapted into a film called Things to Come in 1936. Wells offers a demonstration. He opens a small box on the table to reveal a tiny sled with a large dial on the back. He tells them it's a time machine, and they presume he's making fun of them. As a demonstration, Wells steals a cigar from one of their coat pockets and folds it into the shape of a seated man before tucking it into the miniature time machine. He explains that by pressing the lever forward or backward, the machine will be sent infinitely forward or backward since nothing can stop it in either direction. But he didn't really think this process through because without forcing it to return at a specific time, he can only prove that he made this disappear. Yeah. I, I, I just show them the full size thing. Right. And, and then get in it and use it. Go back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Or if you have to use an example, use an Einstein, you know, like the dog send it somewhere, and then set it so that it comes back automatically. Right. But that's exactly what happens. He uses another man's hand to flip the lever, and the machine whirs to life and dissolves out of focus before vanishing forever. I have a problem with this kind of time travel, though. We'll see this process of time travel multiple times in the film from the perspective of the traveler, and because this is not a DeLorean-style instant flash to the new time period, the time machine should be visible and sitting in place for the entire span of the time that it's traveling through. I agree. Meaning that the miniature time machine should still be here on the table right now. In fact, any inanimate object is automatically traveling through time infinitely until its path is interrupted. And this movie doesn't quite grasp the concept or it works around the concept of when things interact, like when he's when he's like buried in the ground. Right, right, right. It's like, well, is he buried? Or, or is he in a bubble where he's not affected by the things around him? Correct. Yeah. And if that's the case, if there is a bubble, then putting your hand in that space where the bubble is would interfere with the passage of the time machine. Right, yeah. When the man asks where the model went, he explains that it's still in this room, but it's in the future now. But if the time machine didn't work, it would already be in the future. 
you know what a good way, to, good way to prove it would be to just pull the table away because then at that point it should fall to the ground and smash and break and p- p- would it i don't know. i don't know or would it just hover there invisible because it seems like what he doesn't mention is that this time machine also comes with a cloaking device when it is in motion mm. but then i don't understand why they're not hitting it when they swat through the air where right. it was Wells says that it's probably 100 years away by now, which is a weird way to put it. (laughs) It's either there 100 (laughs) years from now or it isn't. (laughs) It would take a certain amount of time to (laughs) be 100 years from now. Time time is irrelevant. It's like, what do we want? Time travel. When do we want it? It's It's irrelevant. (laughs) (laughs) To illustrate how time can change space, he mentions that this exact spot might have been underwater in the past or might be the interior of an enormous mountain in the years to come. The men start to ask practical application questions, and Wells says, he just wants to see the future. Shut up, guys. I just want to see what's going to happen. That reminds me of being in art school, and they're like, what does your art mean? And I'm like, doesn't matter. I just made a cool thing, yeah. guys. Shut up. Shut up and look at it. <laughs> but look here, George. Supposing you do go off and get lost in the 50th century or something, how are you going to get back? And I wanted him to say, well, that's the best part. This time machine is also a fucking time machine, genius. <laughs> <laughs> it goes both ways. I do like that some like the 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 one professor is like very like contrarian, but the one guy who watched the time machine disappear puts his drink down and backs away because yeah. he's like shaken. He's like, "What did you put in this drink?" Yeah, he, he's like visibly like, "Oh God, I I, I need to leave because something's <laughs> going on here and I need to get out." They ask him how he intends to monetize this device because they are idiots. How about I go back in time and bet my life savings that you guys grow up to be dumbasses. <laughs> The men tell him he should focus his attention on weapons since the Boer War is on. Mr. Wells, or George, as he'll be referred to for the rest of the story, is upset at their short-sightedness, and the men all leave together except Philby. You remember the last time we talked about the Boer War? Uh, The last time, um, would it have been Breaker Morant? That's what I think. Okay. I think that's right. Outside, people are ringing in the new year in the middle of the day for some reason. <laughs> it's like noon, and they're all like, yeah. Happy New Year! I was really confused. I was, like, I was like, wait, wasn't it night? Oh, no, this is a flashback. But wait, why are they meeting together in the middle of the day? Yeah. It's actually a new century, too, the 1900s. But technically, doesn't the new century start on the first It starts year? in 1901, yeah. yeah. But the 1900s started in 1900. <laughs> George reads in the paper about the Boer War and rushes to his desk. It seems he's about to write the note that watch it delivered to the dinner table one week later. Philby senses something's bothering George and won't leave until he's explained himself. Philby wants George to explain his obsession with time, and George for some reason assumes that in the future, war won't exist? Like, it seems like that's his understanding, is that we will trend toward peace, and so there won't be war like there is now. Because there hasn't been a thousand, right. two thousand, three thousand years of human history. Yeah. People cause war. That's what we do. Phil B. warns George against playing God with his machine. If that machine can do what you say it can, destroy it. Destroy it, George, before it destroys you. Phil B. invites George back to his home to see his son Jamie again for the first time in a while. George turns him down. Before he leaves, Phil B. asks George's word that he won't leave the house today. I don't know where he's worried about George going, but why didn't he just say, don't use the time machine? <laughs> right. Please don't use the time machine. And he also lies. Yeah. He says, I won't go out the door. He does. The front door? Yeah. That day? No, in the future. No, he said, I won't do it today. Oh. So he kept his promise. (laughs) But at San Dimas, it's still the same time. It's always the same time (laughs) in San Dimas, yeah. Ted, don't forget to wind your watch. With Philby gone, George returns to his desk and scribbles a note about a dinner with the same men on January the 5th. He informs Mrs. Watchett of the dinner plans. George heads to his locked laboratory where we reveal the full-size time machine prop. It's gorgeous, and it's got a bunch of cool steampunk flourishes. Yeah, th- this this also accentuates what a great inventor he is, that he was able to miniaturize Right, and the, it's the a machine. functional time machine still. <laughs> that is crazy. It's like, it was like he, he built the full-size model, and then he built the miniature, like he, he miniaturized that technology. He, it, should, it should have been a watch. You know what he did? He wear. He built two time machines, but one of them he built out of Shrinky Dinks. <laughs> <laughs> and then he built a giant no, oven. The, the passage is really hot. It just shrank. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the future was hot. I'm not clear why, but when he first reaches out to touch the machine, it looks like his hand is bleeding, and he smears blood all over the controls to the time machine. Did you see this? I didn't. I didn't notice. It's really weird. It's a lot of blood. And I was like, 
Did he cut his hand? I like backed it up. Like, did he get a paper cut when he was writing the note? He doesn't get a paper cut. He just reaches out to touch the thing, and there's just blood like gushing out of his finger. And then in the next shot, his hand is clean, and the time machine is clean. It's like, huh. what was that? I don't understand. The controls have three lights on the dash, a month, a day, and a year, and they're all backlit in different colors. George pushes the lever forward, but only about an hour and 38 minutes. His pocket watch confirms that almost no time has passed within the machine. And didn't, didn't you point out that there's no... Uh, that, that all the lighting seems to be candles in this movie, yeah, and yet like we somehow don't, we this don't have light panel is backlit? <laughs> I mean, there were, there were batteries... I guess, like rudimentary batteries at yeah. the time. But it seems like this thing never needs to be charged. I mean, it's a fucking time machine, so All right, right. maybe he invented batteries on the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's another thing that bothers me about like all these time machine movies. Like Nobody figured it out after you. <laughs> You're literally the <laughs> only person with a time machine. There's nobody else at the end of the universe with a time machine showing up. I feel like if you're the steampunk guy with a time machine, you're maybe the first one, mm. but there's going to be other people with time machines eventually. Right. And then that, that's 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 sort of the plot of the day the Earth sits still is is that the Earth is ready ready to go into space and all the other people in space are saying hold your butt right yeah. here like <laughs> we we got rules about going into space yeah so a guy invents time machine immediately time machine yeah police. a bunch of time machine people show up yeah is that why there's all those spheres floating around right now yeah did we get too close to time machines yeah the time cops are here they have us surrounded come out with your times up. <laughs> <laughs> What the time hell does that up? mean? Are you saying Hashtag time's up? Time's up. Time, they just start shooting. <laughs> George throws the lever forward again, and we see a candle burn down, a clock spins, a snail races by, flowers open and close to follow the sun. He notices a mannequin in a store window across the street and pushes the lever forward to shoot the sun across the sky faster and faster. He goes forward about six months, and already the dress on the mannequin out the window looks completely foreign to him. Good heavens. That's a dress? Yeah, looks like a pretty regular dress, dude. I'm not even from your time, and it looks normal. He fast-forwards through dozens of outfits, and the plants in his garden are all overgrown now. An apple tree bears fruit, and then suddenly the laboratory windows are all boarded up, and he stops the machine. The room is covered in cobwebs and dust, and we are now in September 7th, 1917. He has to punch more boards off of his front door to leave the building, and straightens out his front yard sundial before crossing the street to Philby's department store. He's shocked by the sight of a horseless carriage pulling up in front, and when Philby steps out, he calls to the man. Philby! Well, what are you doing going to a masquerade party? After a bit of confusion, Philby explains that he's actually James Philby, the son of David Philby. Both men are being played by Alan Young. James has some unfortunate news about the elder Philby. He was killed in the war a year ago. He asks what James knows about the home across the street, and younger Philby explains that his father owned the land and made arrangements for the building's preservation in case the inventor ever returned. George confuses James Philby by not knowing about the war they've been fighting, and the men part ways. George returns to the boarded-up house, but pulls down the wood, blocking his view of the mannequin first. He throws the lever forward again, and all the windows above him shatter out of their frames. The ground begins to shake in 1940, and George assumes it's a mechanical defect, but we know this as the Blitz the bombing of London in World War II. Somehow, he's able to deduce that this is a different war than the last one he stopped during. He pushes the lever again, and a bomb destroys the house around him. He watches stop-motion animation of skyscrapers coming up. He pulls the lever to a stop in 1966 when he hears air raid sirens blaring. I, I like the effect of the the siren being really sped up and yeah. then slowing down as he resumes normal time. And I, I like that that's what caused him to stop. Yeah. But that means that the sirens was going for going off for years. <laughs> Wouldn't that also mean that you'd have like a Doppler effect of like sound just crushing your ears the mm. whole time? Wouldn't it be deafening to go through time? Probably. I also think it'd be blinding though. Yeah. I mean, if, if he had epilepsy, he definitely would have died <laughs> trying to go a few days into the future when the, with the sun flashing around like that. Well, I just think that, it, you know, if, if you're being exposed to all the light that is happening within yeah. that time, you know, like it would be infinitely bright. Yeah. Outside the house, people are running for shelter past him. George is distracted by a placard in the park, which reads, This park is dedicated by James Philby to his father's devotion for his friend George. That makes it sound an awful lot like James Philby's father and George were lovers. 
but I'm not sure that's the implication. <laughs> it's just like, to my father and his special friend yeah. and their wonderful lifelong devotion. I get very Sappho and her friend vibes from this message. They were roommates. <laughs> oh my God, they were roommates. After everyone has disappeared, an elderly James Philby shuffles out of the store in a full-blown radiation suit. This particular costume is one of several pieces borrowed from the production of Forbidden Planet, 1956. He tries to corral George into the bomb shelter, but George doesn't understand the danger. Come along, young me. man. Come along. Come along. You better hurry or the mushrooms will be sprouting. Mushrooms? What? Impossibly, Philby recognizes George from their two-minute interaction 23 years ago. He doesn't understand why George hasn't aged, and George tries to explain while the air raid sirens blare again. It'll take a little time to explain, but you see, it's the last alert. Hurry! Hurry. Philby ducks into the shelter, but George just stands around until a nuclear blast knocks him over. All the buildings around him are immediately on fire, and the road is torn open as if it's on a fault line. Volcanoes rise up from the ground in place of the buildings. But then Mother Earth, aroused by man's violence, responded with volcanic violence of her own. The lava here is oatmeal dyed orange and red and tilted across a miniature of the city. It looks great. Yeah, it looks pretty I, cool. I, I loved it. I, I, when it when it start, starts like pushing the car. On the car, yeah. 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 I was like, oh, that's great. The lava wraps around the space where the time machine sat and hardens as time passes and fast forward. Just as he predicted, the location of George's home is now the interior of a mountain. So my question is, if he were to stop, would he just be suddenly encased? I think so, in, yeah. In, 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 if he can get into the time machine, then so can lava. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying if if he stopped it in the middle, would there be a bubble around him, or would he be like, would there be rock right up against right. his skin? No, I, I believe I believe that if he were to bring the time machine to a stop, he would be in solid. He would be, yeah. he would be one with the rock. Correct. Right? We would yeah. encase him he, in a the... superposition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a filmic example of that where a person like appeared inside of something else. Uh, well, Han Solo. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's different. <laughs> um, you ever seen the the Australian short? It's a snap. I don't know if I have. Where it's like, like a guy's like oh, doing yes, a college yeah. tour and yes. he like keeps snapping and appearing. They keep appearing in different places, but you he, see he appears inside of a pole. He's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, I remember an X-Files episode where um, there was a temporal displacement rigmarole where they had a rock with a lizard in it because the rock and the lizard were occupying two, it, it, a physical space, but in two different times. Interesting. George can't see anything changing outside until the mountain erodes around him. He strikes a match to read the display, but the time machine is backlit. <laughs> You're in a pitch black mountain. <laughs> this makes no sense. After many millennia, the mountain crumbles around him in a stop motion sequence, and George watches another human society arise on the plains in front of him. He stops the machine at 802,701, but he stops it so fast that the machine spins in place and then falls over. We also get a weird shot of what looks like dry ice being thrown at George while he lies in the grass. <laughs> it actually looks like a line of dry ice was just like tipped off of a mm -hmm. board above him, <laughs> but it's just very like lazily done. But I also don't understand the purpose of this as far as a storytelling element. Like that he falls out of it. That he falls out of it and he's knocked unconscious. But when he comes to nothing, has nothing changed. changed yeah. <laughs> it's like, I was like, well, like the, this is where the machine should have been gone. I think they were just trying to make it epic that he'd gone mm -hmm. almost a million years in the future. George notices an enormous sphinx-shaped structure just behind his machine, and he goes and knocks on what looks like the entrance, which is a giant metal garage door. He removes the crystal ignition from the time machine to take with him. That That's like one of the smartest things that he does. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, other people can't use it without him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unlike the next movie that we're about to review where everybody leaves their keys in every vehicle they pass. Right. <laughs> George wanders through the nearest jungle and appreciates all the new flowers. The fruits and flowers are all foreign to him. He finds a demolished and abandoned glass dome nearby with a shattered ceiling. The doors open this time, and he finds a few dozen tables all set for a feast with fresh fruit. He picks up a plate and starts smashing it around just to get people's attention, but it's a big round room, so he should see it's empty. And why are you trying to destroy their shit, dude? You could go to jail for that. You don't know how this <laughs> planet works. Anybody here? He leaves, and a bombastic, menacing score chases him along to a nearby stream and a tribe of humans. While he watches them, the air is pierced by the screams of a woman drowning in the river, but her fellow people make no efforts to save her. George tears off his jacket and jumps into the water to rescue the girl. This is Yvette Mimieux, playing a character we'll come to know as Weena. Or as my talk-to-text put it, Weener. <laughs> <laughs> 
On the shore, George drapes his jacket over her, and when she realizes she is saved, she wanders wordlessly away from him. The people all return to the dome for lunch, and George takes a seat on the steps outside. Weena brings him his jacket and asks why he saved her. Do you realize there are about 20 of your friends watching you drown? Not one of them so much as lifted a finger to save you? It's a very curious attitude. <sighs> very curious world. He asks her if they have elders she can take him to, to get more information, but she says there's no one older here. He teaches her how to write her name in the dust on the steps and asks what her people are called. What are your people called? Eloy. As the sun begins to set, she leads him inside. George digs oh, hungrily. I was going to say. I, I think it's funny here when he's, uh, you know, spelling things out for her. He just uh, guesses how they're spelled. Yeah, he just yeah. I'm just like Eloy. Like, like, Definitely E-L-O-I. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's how I would have randomly no. picked to spell it. And then to end it with a period. <laughs> George digs hungrily into their food and tries to ask questions, but most of the Eloy ignore him. Also, don't don't eat the food. Yeah, and you don't know what that's going to do to your body. Yeah, you don't know what a millennia of new bacteria and microorganisms are living in this yeah. food. Just die. Don't eat. Die. You got to bring food from your own yeah, time. Bring a, bring a cliff bar you, or something. Yeah, even Doc Brown... <laughs> brought underwear with him because he's allergic to all synthetics. You're not oh, going to be true? able to get through customs with your own fruit. That's true. Are there time customs? I guess that's what like Owen Wilson's people are doing. Owen Loki. <laughs> 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 they're more the time. Yeah, they're time police. Yeah, they, they do. I guess that is customs. He gets a word back here and there. They have no government, no laws, no work. They don't know where their food and clothes come from, and they aren't even curious. He asks about books, and they lead him to their library. The books are very brittle, and the pages break apart in his hands. This specific book he's holding is Charles Morris's The Marvelous Career of Theodore Roosevelt. Scientist that he is, he destroys all of the knowledge of the ancients by karate chopping the bookshelf to <laughs> dust instead of preserving what little remains. This this whole section is uh, is giving, like, Logan's run here, where yeah. everybody is kind of or dressed. Zardoz. <laughs> <laughs> they're all dressed the same and they don't they aren't really questioning things they're all the same age yeah but it made me wonder i'm like where are the the baby ones like where, yeah. where are the mm. little ones until and, they and get the book, to this there's, time there's babies okay there's there's younger everyone's ones. just 20 years old here yeah also like i imagine you know they they teach themselves words just as a means of communication right but why such unnecessary words for things that they don't have like government right you don't have a government it's like then why do you know what that means? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the fact that he's like, I can literally read the words on this page, mm -hmm. and then he squeezes it as hard as he can and it crumbles to dust. It's like, would you do that in fucking Tut's tomb? Yeah. Like, the library with, you pick up a book and you're like, oh my God, it's so brittle. How dare you not make newer editions? It's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is old shit, dude. You got to be careful with it. I'm just impressed that they still speak English. Yeah. So well, that's because well. of the mm -hmm. rings, right? Mm. Weirdly, he's mad at the Eloy man for the information he just destroyed. Thousands of years of building and rebuilding, creating and recreating, so you can let it crumble to dust. And it's like, it was books a second ago, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you just smashed it. He returns to the dome and shouts a lecture at the rest of the Eloy before storming out. Weena follows him to the door, but doesn't risk stepping outside. When George gets back to his time machine, there are tracks in the dirt and big clomping footprints where somebody dragged it into the Sphinx building before locking the doors shut again. He pounds on the door with a rock, but the Eloy have even neglected their rocks and the stone crumbles uselessly <laughs> against the door. I thought it was more of like a Moe's hardness. Like that. Oh, okay, that's how hard it is. <laughs> it's, it's right between Diamond and that underwater level on Ninja Turtles. <laughs> in terms of hardness. <laughs> He notices a shape in the bushes and finds that Weena has followed him out here to look after him and return for her rescue earlier. She explains that only the Morlocks can open these doors. The Morlocks? Well, who are the Morlocks? She explains the Morlocks are their providers. She urges him back to the dome, but he insists they camp here so he can get his time machine back in the morning. He tells her that his home was right here thousands of years ago. Hundreds of thousands of years ago. In the middle of retelling this story, Weena is dragged away by a Morlock and George tackles the monster away from her. And when it scrambles off, George gives her his jacket again, like it has restorative powers. It's mm -hmm. like, you just drowned. Have a jacket. <laughs> you just got attacked by a Morlock. Put on a jacket. <laughs> Everything will be fine. It's a magic jacket. I didn't well, mention it at all to my investor friends, but it's a magic jacket. <laughs> I also don't understand the, the Morlocks in this moment when... <laughs> what are they doing? Yeah, like, why would they just drag her yeah, away? It's not feeding time right now. But I think it's just to discourage 
people coming out of the dome. Mm. Yeah, every time a cow gets out of its pen, I just eat it. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> Free cow, it's on the road. <laughs> a cow gets out, then it's going to have a field day. Weena tries to put her hand in the campfire George made, and he stops her and wraps her hand in a jacket. No, he doesn't do that, but <laughs> it would have helped. Wait, didn't she already just get dragged away? Yeah, but he fought the thing off oh, and he brought did. her back. Okay. He apologizes for the lectures that he's given her people. Their ignorance is not their fault. He asks why she followed him out here when she was safe in the dome, and he presumes that all the Eloi might have this same protective instinct. I think all your people have it, really. It, it just needs someone to reawaken it. He asks her about what the Morlocks even are and how the Eloi came to be, but her society doesn't study or even acknowledge the past, with the exception of these talking rings we're about to deal with. He tells her that her people are in the equivalent of their dark ages, but he thinks he can inspire a change. Seems like any change from what they're doing, aside from maybe swimming lessons, would only make things worse. <laughs> their lives are complete leisure. You cannot improve on that by teaching people how to work and study all day. That sucks. Yeah. Don't a, do that. There's a line where it's like, doesn't anybody work? It's like, <laughs> yeah. nobody works anymore. Nobody wants to work anymore. Yeah. <laughs> We're still going to be saying that in 807, 200 and <laughs> yeah. 8,000 years from now. I'm just going to let myself be eaten by Morlocks. That's great. <laughs> What's my time, DDB? What time's dinner? In the morning, when George can't break into the Sphinx, he walks around it to a group of exhaust vents in a clearing. We can hear machines under the ground, and Weena tells him that everything she knows about the machines she learned from the magic talking rings, and he asks her to lead him to them. She leads him to another sort of library, but this one's full of inventions and art. They find a large table covered in dust and metal rings. She shows him how to work it. She spins the ring on the glass at the center of the table, and the ring glows from underneath, as a voice provides some exposition. The war between the East and West, which is now in its 326th year, has at last come to an end. There is nothing left to fight with, and few of us left to fight. The atmosphere has become so polluted with deadly germs that it can no longer be breathed. There is no place on this planet that is immune. The last surviving factory for the manufacture of oxygen has been destroyed. Stockpiles are rapidly diminishing. And when they are gone, we must die. This felt very Wally to me. Yeah. The ring skitters to a stop at the end of the paragraph. But nice timing. Does it yeah. decide what it's going to tell you based on how long the sound bite has to be? It's strange that the table doesn't require a question. It just plays a random recording from history. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, like, th like if you were to spin it again, would it start over? Would it go further if you got more of a spin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be funny if, if he goes to spin it again. It's like, that thong, that thong, thong, thong. It's like, sorry, it just does fix things at random. <laughs> the next one we hear is a voice from the past that claims to be the last of the original mankind. He mentions that the human race has divided between great underground caverns and the planet's surface. In case we didn't understand the words he used, we get them summarized by Rod Taylor and voiceover, presumably another glimpse back at the dinner table where he's telling this story to other people. The Morlocks had become the masters and the Eloi their servants. The Morlocks maintained them and bred them like, like cattle, only to take them below when they reached maturity, which explained why there were no older people among them. They return to the field of chimneys, and Rod prepares to climb down into the Morlock stronghold. This seems like a bad idea. Yeah. The, the whole area is is desolated. Yeah. So it's like, clearly there's horrible, toxic up. stuff coming up out of this. Yeah. Just as he starts to disappear into the hole, a siren sounds from horns above the Sphinx building, and Weena's eyes go blank. She turns to follow the noise. George notices her retreat and comes back out to find where she's disappeared to. We see all the Eloi are entranced and walking toward the Sphinx building. George chases her all the way there, but the closing metal doors trap her inside and he can't get to her. He asks the rest of the Eloi to explain what happened to the people inside and they don't reply. What is wrong? There is nothing wrong. It is all clear. What do you mean all clear? All clear. The middle 1900s, the falling bombs, the people calling out, oh, all clear. No, that's gone, that's past. It occurs to George that the sound he just heard was the same air raid siren from the war of the 1960s. Maybe even the same mechanism, since it's in the same place. I just think that's, that's such a jump, and like I realize maybe it was more obvious in the book, but it feels like such a jump to make that connection when he... 
experienced that just once in his mm-hmm. brief yeah, but travels. it was earlier today though i know but i'm just like i don't think i would have necessarily made that connection i mean i would i recognized it as an air raid siren uh, but he didn't know what that sound was until he heard it the first time you're right in, yeah in the 60s but i th- i think the point is supposed to be that this is the bomb shelter has been converted into this no i, I think i think that is the point yeah. i just think that you know that that's something that's not like an air raid siren is not something that was internalized by him. Right, yeah. So I just feel like when you experienced it very briefly once earlier in the day, I don't think that that would be where my brain goes to. It also seemed like he was doing a great job of ignoring it too because <laughs> Philby was like, oh, we got to go. We got to get underground right now. And he's like, anyway, I built a time machine. Look, oh, the park is so pretty this time of year. And everyone's like running and screaming. The only Eloy responding to George tells him that when the people go inside, they never come back. George returns to the chimneys a third time and climbs down to set things right. A group of Eloy follow him to the hole, seemingly out of curiosity. George finds himself in what looks like an underground dungeon. He fashions a torch from a stick and a dry growth off the cave wall. As he turns a corner, we get a sharp sting on the track, and George looks shocked. He's found a pile of Eloy skeletons on the cave floor. So this was the destiny of the Eloy. They were being bred by the Morlocks, who had degenerated into the lowest form of human life. Cannibalism. Is that the lowest form? I feel like there's steps below that, but... He's still carrying this torch around, but he hasn't lit it yet, and he starts to notice glowing Morlock eyes in the darker corners of the cave. When he pauses for a moment, one of the Morlocks reaches up behind him, but is startled itself by the crack of a whip. Another Morlock is shepherding the Eloy into an underground cell. George finds Weena and drags her away from the group, trying to wake her up, when suddenly the whip wraps around his neck. This looks like super painful. Like It yeah. looks like they actually threw a whip around Rod Taylor's neck. Well, and there's, what's really cool about the Morlocks is that a couple of times when you just see like their eyes in the dark, they blink. Yeah. And I was like, oh, crap. How did you do that? Yeah, like that makes it a lot more real. Yeah. Like, I, I, like glowing eyes is like, oh, creepy, they have glowing eyes. But when you start seeing them blink, it's like, oh, no, don't yeah. like this. <laughs> George yanks down the Morlock at the other end of the whip around his neck and then turns the weapon on the cave dwellers. Eventually, he's tackled to the ground by one and he drops it. They corral him into the same cave with the other Eloy prisoners. He decides his new weapon will be a single lit match and somehow it's enough to scare all the Morlocks back. He uses a third match to light the torch that he made, but he requires a strip of Weena's dress to keep it burning. Or at least he claims to and it looks like the piece of fabric falls right off of it immediately. Just as quickly, the torch is whipped out of his hand, and he's dealing with the Morlocks mano y mano. A pack of Eloy are inspired by George to attempt an escape, but they're quickly surrounded by more Morlock locks. Weena tries to collect the torch when another Morlock picks her up and tries to carry her away. Once again, George comes to her rescue, but this time, when he needs rescuing himself, more Eloy join the fight. I was going to say, yeah, one of the Eloy, like, full-on, like, uh, George McFly's. Yeah. Like, he just starts looking at his fist yeah. closing up. <laughs> Get your damned hands off of him. One of the Morlocks is kicked hard against a rock wall and coughs blood all over himself. George leads the Eloy back to the tunnels he entered through. Along the way, he sets fire to a tube that seems to just be leaking gasoline into the cave. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what this is for. Well, I don't even know what the Morlocks, they, they're running machines, but for what purpose yeah. and, and to what end. It's just their AC. <laughs> it's really hot, hot down underground, here. yeah. Everything goes up in flames very quickly, and one Morlock in particular runs around on fire for a while, and that's amusing. The Eloy <laughs> all escape to the surface. He instructs all the escapees and other Eloy standing by to throw all the dry wood they can into the hole to smoke out the Morlocks from their own home. Eventually, each of these chimneys explodes from a combination of the fire and whatever gas leaks they seem to have going on down there. We see the entire area collapse into the hole as the Morlock caves are filled with dirt, burying the monsters alive, or possibly already dead. The underworld of the Morlocks was gone, and so was the life of leisure for the Eloi. But then what of me? I was imprisoned in a world in which I just did not belong. And it's like, yeah, you kind of screwed up this planet for all these people. You should feel terrible. Weena apologizes to George that he's been stranded in this paradise and can't return to the Victorian nightmare that he couldn't wait to escape at the start of the film. Weena asks if he left a woman behind in his time, and he says he did, but then he specifies that she was 62 and she cleaned his house. Yeah, but that does not clarify anything. Right. 
Weena is relieved because somehow she understands 19th century indentured servitude from all the way here in the future. It's like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what 62 means. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, what's 62? <laughs> what does that mean? Is like that her name? Two of my is her age? Name 62? Three of my age, probably. She asks how the women of his time wear their hair, and George just guesses because he's probably never looked at a woman before now. Some of the Eloy notice that the fire in the Morlock cave has spread to the Sphinx building, and the doors are now open to reveal his time machine inside. George calls Weena to join him as he installs the ignition switch on the machine, but the doors close between them and she's locked outside. It seems the Morlocks have set a trap for him. A few surviving Morlock appear and attack George, but he somehow manages to get the machine started and throws the lever forward to kill the Morlocks with time. They rot in a stop-motion animated fast-forward sequence until they leave behind grotesque Neanderthal skeletons. So, I mean, this goes back to the other question of, like, so the moment that he engages the machine... He turns invisible and time they They playing. can't interact with it right, at all. Yeah. Right. But they seem to collapse, like, right on it. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> That's what's weird, too. In, in the 2002 time machine, like, there's a fight at the end of the film where the Guy Pierce time traveler is holding on to the bad guy's hand while he's dangling from the the time machine and then he pushes the lever forward to go through time so suddenly the guy that's hanging underneath the machine the part of his hand that's inside the bubble is fine but the part that's outside is aging super fast and he turns into a skeleton and then it falls off yeah i mean i get that because he's hanging on to it but like if but it's like what is he hanging from if there's literally nothing physically well, there that, that's kind of my question is these guys that are collapsing in front of him so the moment that you disappeared in front of me on your time machine i just sat down and stayed there forever like yeah. i didn't just walk away and be like oh well i guess yeah. i move on with my life all that would happen <laughs> is that i'm very convincingly not moving while i sit here and i'm not aging that's all that would be different so really when he started up that miniature time machine he should have just been like look it the mm -hmm. cigar's not aging a second and it's like how would i tell yeah Leave it here for a million years and that cigar won't age a day. It's like, I won't notice. George realizes that he's not headed to the past like he planned and yanks the lever down to get back home. Infuriatingly, he keeps taking his eyes off the dashboard, which displays the year he's headed to. It's like, you're going 800,000 years back. Can you just look at the screen and see mm -hmm. what year you're in? The dash, by the way, features an engraving, which reads, Manufactured by H. George Wells, as a tribute to both the book's author of the same name and the film's director, George Powell. Because the Morlocks had dragged the time machine into their cave, it is now 10 feet from where he started it. So when he arrives back on January 5th of 1900, the time machine is out in his garden, and he has to drag it back inside. We recognize his outfit here as the burnt-up and torn clothing that he showed up to the dinner wearing. And we see the men sitting around the table again, listening to the end of the story. I wanted him to be like, and then I came in here yeah. and I started to tell you the story of last week when we all met right here. And it's like, why? You don't have to keep going. You didn't have to tell us that part. His friends offer their appreciation for his storytelling, but they don't believe a word of it. The only proof he has of his journey is a flower that he finds in his pocket that Weena had given him. He offers it to Philby, who admits that it's unlike any flower known in the world because Philby owns a department store. Yeah. And he would know. Again, everybody leaves except for Philby. All the fancy investors head out into the snow, and when Philby stops in the doorway, George offers him what seems like a very permanent goodbye. Thanks for being such a good friend, David. Always. Back at the carriage on the street, the men ask Philby what he thinks of George's story, and he confesses that a flower like the one he was just given could not have grown in winter or anywhere near here. He says that, yet half the sequence of him using the time machine is, is on, in a greenhouse. Is in a greenhouse yeah. full of flowers opening and closing. Yeah. Philby says goodnight to the men and returns to George's home. We see George dragging the time machine from the garden, but by the time Philby finds the laboratory with Mrs. Watchett, the time machine is gone again. Philby deduces that the tracks on the floor indicate the time machine appeared in the garden and that George dragged it inside before leaving to reach Weena back outside the Sphinx building. <laughs> I'm here, Weena. <laughs> yeah. Right on top. <laughs> I did this too exactly. That, that's the problem. If you do kill her, does traveling through time save her at all? Or is it a fixed universe? Well, when, Because we never see him break the continuity. Correct. Yeah. He, he never goes back to a time where he would have interacted with himself. Yeah. So it's a situation where he couldn't actually save her if he did that. Right. So if when he returns, we assume that he's returning after he had disappeared. I mean, I don't see why he couldn't as long as he doesn't like Ron Silver touch himself. Mm-hmm. That's the rule, right? <laughs> In Time Cop. <laughs> you can't touch yourself from another time. So that he could appear outside the Sphinx again. 
and help the Eloi build a new world. Build a new world for himself. As they walk back through the house, Philby wonders if George shouldn't have taken something with him to help him rebuild. Watch it notices three books are missing from the bookshelf in his office, but she can't tell which ones are gone. We see this bookshelf earlier in the film, and the books have been rearranged since then, so you can't just tell which mm. ones are missing. Oh, you gave me assignment I completely forgot about. Yeah, it. you can come up with it right now if you want. Shit. I don't know. Is it important? Oh, I suppose not. Only, which three books would you have taken? Watch it lets Philby back out into the snow, and the film is over. What books would you take back to the Eloy to restart society, Richard? Well, I thought about this a lot of different ways. Okay. Uh, because uh, when I was a kid, we had a dictionary. <laughs> and I feel like this is kind of a cheat. Um, we had a dictionary, but it was a easily like three or 4,000 page dictionary. Yeah. It was like the size of like five phone books stacked up. Okay. And it had, and, and the print was all super tiny inside. Interesting. It was a very comprehensive dictionary, but it had whole sections dedicated to col- full color illustrations of different sea life. So anatomy. it's almost like an encyclopedia, but it's it's in full alphabetical order. Correct. Yeah. It was, it was a very fascinating thing. I used to look, look through it all the time because it had all kinds of weird pages about one sec, one whole full color page was about the different styles of cutting gems. Oh, interesting. For display, yeah. Like you know, like if it's square or if it's brilliant cut, which right, like right. The, you know, I was like, and uh, it was such a unique book. I was like, but I feel like that would be a, one of them. No, I don't think that's. I, cheating I feel at like all. it's a cheat. No, well, because I feel like language is an important. Uh, you know, if yeah, we're absolutely. Talk about the English language for this movie for the purposes since they speak English. Yeah. Uh, a book about the nature of English language and all the words that they could use would be certainly be a useful book for me. Yeah. But as far as like mainstream kind of more published kind of things, I would think sure. the origin of species uh, would be a, a good one to take. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was thinking animal farm. Oh, okay. Uh, I think that's a good parable and it's simple you know, it's a, it's a book that we read in, you yeah. know, in junior and high. Yeah, presumably, like, these people would be or would soon be familiar with farming in general. Yeah, but but also just the nature of you have – it's class. You know, yeah. you had this class who was treating you like this and you were being – you know. Yeah. And, and it's a very simple story with with a very clear message about resisting that kind of thing. Right, yeah. Uh, and uh, so, like, to me, like, those are like, – like, I can think of, like, other fun things to bring, like – like, but there's there's no concept of things like satire, right? right so right. like you can't bring like a fun book, but like works of like Thomas Paine or or something like that. Would sure, be sure, sure. Interesting. Did you pick out some books, Jess? I didn't. Um, you know, I was gonna bring the Hitchhiker's Guide until Richard said they don't <laughs> understand satire. <laughs> well, you can explain it to them if you want. No, this is really funny because <laughs> because me, I'm gonna is, do yeah. some marginalia here, so you guys get this book. <laughs> Uh, and somebody pointed out the other day, I don't remember what I was watching, but they pointed out that something like The Hitchhiker's Guide doesn't actually even totally make sense when we read it as like Americans because something that's supposed to be mundane and average is British and weird to us yeah. already. <laughs> so we're just like, oh, those wacky people always driving on the wrong side of the road. It's like, oh, they drink tea every day, but maybe they also bring towels everywhere? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it could be a thing. Isn't that a thing you tea towel? No, teetotal. Teetotal tears. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your your one book you would bring? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I think that um, so- something obviously comprehensive, like you're saying, a, a dictionary or an encyclopedia obviously sounds uh, pretty important. And maybe, you know, something relevant to government uh you know gonna bring like the prince or something like that sure. mm. you know yeah get some machiavellian yeah stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it, it, it's hard to say what's the most what would be the three most important things to bring um yeah. i don't know i i was just thinking more along the lines of as a basis for a society so my first one was charles darwin's origin of the species and then Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Mm. See, I think those things are the problem is that those things are they're they're like post 
reaching a survival moment. You know, like mm-hmm. you, you have to get to survival first. So I almost feel like, you know, that's a secondary thought. And, you, and, and at first you need the books that are about how to farm right. and how to well, create line. machines. and Yeah. My, my third option is R.L. Stein's Say Cheese and Die. <laughs> <laughs> Because I feel like it'll teach them the danger of cameras and stuff. Like the farmer's almanac. Like I need to know the the weather and right. the. But is that relevant no, in eight thousand totally years not. from now? I don't know. Yeah, you just gotta adjust it a few months. You know, I don't know how to make knots. Like I know I need something that tells me how to make important knots. Mm. <laughs> you, you know, it'd be good. Uh, one of those really comprehensive how it works books. Yeah. There you go. Like with the full colors and the breakdowns. Or like an I Spy book. Or like Where's a mag- Waldo? Magic guy book. <laughs> magic it's very guy. important that you guys see this fucking chair. <laughs> I can't do it. You're you're moving it too fast. We have three eyes. This will never work. <laughs> Shut up and squint. Differences from the book. Philby is just another man in the room. Like he's not like a close advisor who we deal with in various times. He's just a guy who's there who says a couple things. The book doesn't bother with the '60s and jumps directly into the Eloy future. Beyond that. We jump all the way to nearer to the end of the planet's lifetime where the world is populated by enormous crab creatures. <laughs> all, all things revert to crab eventually. Yeah. Uh, Weena is not a young woman, but a child who George regularly carries around in the story. Instead of just burning the Morlock stronghold, George's distraction fire actually burns down the entire surrounding forest, killing both the Morlocks and Weena. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Yeah. The end. Well, if only go- he had a fucking time machine. <laughs> He'll just go back and fix that real quick. <laughs> there, it didn't kill you. But but see, that's the thing, is he couldn't fix it because... Depending on what kind of time yeah. universe, we don't know. Because they didn't paradox anything. But but that's one of the things I like about this movie, is that he, he travels forward from his house, and we see it all boarded up and decayed, and it's like, well, that that's that's in line, because he never does return. Yeah. So right. So his house would end up that way. Yeah. I was just thinking, like, if time travelers were trying to kill each other, and it's like, oh, I'll kill him when he's a baby. And it's like, but I don't know when he's a baby because he's a time traveler. I've only ever encountered. And then you would say, like, oh, well, he was born in 1975. And it's like, oh, you just paradoxed me. (laughs) You gave out my personal information. (laughs) Paradox. Uh... Get it? In 1993, a documentary slash sequel was produced entitled Time Machine, The Journey Back, Toward the end of it, Michael J. Fox appears to introduce a sort of sequel segment featuring Whit Bissell, Alan Young, and Rod Taylor reprising their roles from the film as old men. Bissell addresses the camera directly as Walter Kemp and expresses his fears about what happened to their friend George. And then we cut to Alan Young as Philby wandering around the laboratory in search of any clues of his friend when suddenly an older George Wells returns in the original time machine prop. Philby asks about the girl George went back for, and he sort of implies that they lived their lives together and that she passed away, but she was 12 years younger than him. (laughs) And he has a time machine. (laughs) He can see her whenever he wants to. In reality, Yvette Mimieu only passed away last year at the age of 80. She was the last surviving member of the cast, including babies. There were no babies in this film. We learn that George is here to save his friend before the conflict known as World War I. Will there be others? Many, many others, David. Anyway, I'm here because of this one. He invites Philby to come with him to see the future. In response, Philby tries to take a crowbar to the machine in anger, but Wells talks him down by mentioning conversations that he's had with Philby's grown son. But this doesn't make any sense, though. If they're already old men, wouldn't his son already also be older? Yeah, but not as old as he is in 66 when he's telling him to get into the... The bomb shelter. But wait, what year is this taking place? This conversation between them? Yeah. Well, if you're going by Philby's age, if it was 1993 from 1960, so 33 years later, 1933. So after he's already dead in the war, World War One. I'm confused. This doesn't make sense. Yeah, it doesn't really. Um, he, unless he, it's supposed to be immediately earlier. after the events. It, yeah, well, that's, because that's how the way far that, forward is he? He only goes 17 years before. Right, but that's the way that they're this exactly is more than 17 years. That's what I'm saying. Later. So it doesn't really make sense because his son would be grown and mm-hmm. he would also be dead in the war, unless they're saying that this is right after. But why did they age so much? Yeah, well, you know, it's a different time. 
machine. Time machine. Just say time machine. No, time yeah. machine. No, it's just he's just got some like you know city miles. <laughs> Those were, times were hard back then. Yeah, that mannequin really felt it too. You know how hard it is. So I'm thinking about this like. When you're doing something like stop motion animation and you need something to stay still, but you have to change something around it and it's so difficult to keep, you know, things still. Mm -hmm. um, this mannequin stayed still for dozens of years. Like and it really didn't move and it? the clothes yeah. changed around it, but it did not move That's an inch. Oh, you can probably tell me what's going to happen to me. I had the biggest store in town. Future prime minister, yeah. <laughs> Come on, George. And I wanted him to be like, "Were you not listening to the story I told you around dinner? You fucking die! Remember, I told you that you die. I told a whole room of investors that you die in 1916. 1916. Yeah, I know within a year that you <laughs> yeah. when you die. But he doesn't bother here with directly revealing Philby's fate again before the men part ways. That's the end of the story. He sits down in the time machine and he says he's going to try again, closer to when Philby dies, and that's the end of the story. Time Machine. Big thumbs up. I love this movie. Oh, we're not going to go to the Guy Pierce one? No. Nope. nope. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Time Machine. No, uh, we'll go through it because I just watched it yesterday. Uh, Time Machine, starring Guy Pierce mm -hmm. and Orlando Jones. Orlando Jones. Um, and Jeremy's Iron um, as the, <laughs> the Morlock. King, the King Morlock. <laughs> King Morlock. Uh, so uh, that one. Uh, introduces a sort of romantic element to the necessity of time travel mm -hmm. because uh, Guy Pierce is an inventor. He has a lady friend who he is planning to pop the question to. They meet in a park and they are mugged at the park shortly after she accepts his, his uh, proposal. And she gets shot in the encounter um, and dies. So he spends some time building a time machine. And then when he builds a time machine, he goes back in time to save her and then she dies a different way. Right. She ends up getting killed Final Destination style by a horse that's like running through the street to avoid yeah. a, a motor car. And they don't explain where his version of himself is. Right. In that. But so on, on the home video version, these are the only two deaths. Yeah. But I think in the original theatrical cut, he tries to save her and this keeps happening over and over and over again. And he doesn't understand why he can't save her. But- that one pretty definitively says right up front, you can change the past yeah, in a way that somehow doesn't affect the future. Right. Um, yeah. It the, the, the future is corrected so that the timeline is, is kept. Yeah. But he decides that he can't save her. So instead, he goes back to his house and he gets in the time machine and he goes to the future. Um, and he goes to this sort of halfway into the super distant future. Mm -hmm. He wakes up. Uh, he shows up in an alleyway. And there's advertisements for this lunar colony. They're they're dynamiting a huge section of the moon to make colonies for people to live on the moon. You can go to lunarleisureliving.com to find more information. <laughs> and I tried it and somebody already took it already. <laughs> it's not registered by the studio or anything. Um, and uh, then he scoots forward a little bit more and everyone's freaking out. This is like the 1966 scene where they're like, you got to get to protection right now. Like th everybody's got to get underground. This is dangerous. And he looks up at the sky and he sees that whatever they did, they like, they nuked the moon yeah. to, to make a space colony, but they somehow they shattered the moon and it's breaking apart into pieces and they're all like falling toward the earth and, and wrenching the ground up. And uh, so he jumps back in the time machine and he goes to 800,000 again and he meets a tribe of humans uh, who live on a river. And, and Samantha Mumba. Yeah. And there's Morlocks that attack. It's basically the same movie from, from there mm -hmm. forward. Um, that he has to go and fight the Morlocks and protect them and the end, basically. Time Machine. Time Machine. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I, 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 think, uh, I think it's pretty good. Uh, I have a lot of memories of this movie watching it when I was young. Yeah. Um. Also, uh, when my mom was teaching, uh, she shared a classroom that had like one of those like fold up divider walls. Oh, okay. Uh, and on the other side of the divider wall was a time, a time machine. machine. It was a time machine. Oh my no. god! Um, it, it was the <laughs> the technology class. It was a it was like a secondary school, like for for high school dropouts or people trying yeah. to go back to get school. Um, but this is where all the computer labs were and all that stuff. But they had um, a time machine. 
<laughs> they had, well, why are you telling us about this before? They, it's like, they had, I'll, I'll tell you about it before. All right. <laughs> I'm telling a story of my childhood here. They had, um, you, remember, you remember watching uh, film strips? Where, like, yeah. Like they would show you a still image. And it would beep and you had yeah, to flip yeah, the thing. Yeah, flip the things. Um, what and, are you, wait, what is this thing that you both know? What? The, the, um... This was a projector. It was a projector, and it, you would you would flip the film strips through, and they'd be singular images, and you'd play a, a cassette alongside of it, no. and every time it would beep, you would turn advance. the the film you one more. You guys coordinated this before <laughs> we started recording. This is a made up thing. But one of them that I, I I frequently watched was the film strip of for the movie The Time Machine. How how much of it was it? Like what clip was it? Or was it the whole movie? Well, it was the whole movie, but told like in maybe five minutes. Yeah, oh, okay. but think about it like um one of the um. The Viewmaster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. like a Viewmaster with a recorded story. Or a slideshow. Yeah. That's neat. I want that. Yeah. They were great. Oh, go my God. Every kid in class that. wanted to be the person who got picked that day mm-hmm. to turn the switch to the next slide. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I give it a thumbs up. It's good. I, yeah. I had up. never seen it before. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely watched this in school and then a lot on television. No, I'd never, I'd never seen this one, but um, yeah, I like it. I think, I think it's a good introduction to time travel movies because man, do they get way more complicated. Yeah, and the, the kids understood <laughs> it. We watched it with oh, the they kids, actually, and they actually sat through the whole movie. Totally got it. Not just sat through this movie, but actually, I think liked it yeah. and wanted to keep watching it. Which I, you know, their attention. It's spans. really colorful. It has a lot of like stop motion animated sequences. I can't get them to watch effects. amazing movies. You know, not that this isn't like an amazing movie, but I'm just saying like movies that I think are t- are even m- much more engaging than this one, yeah. and they like really paid attention to this one. Yeah, yeah, they got sucked in. Yeah. Our director here was George Powell. He is an animator by trade who transitioned to film directing and producing in the 50s. He has credits in Byron Haskins' War of the Worlds. He directed Tom Thumb. The Wonderful World of the Brothers Grimm, and The Seven Faces of Dr. Lau, which was the first film to win an Oscar for makeup for William Tuttle, who also designed the Morlocks here. The writer was David Duncan. He wrote the English version of Rodan. He wrote five episodes of My Three Sons, an Outer Limits episode, and he's credited again in the 2002 Time Machine remake because from a certain point it takes very much after this film. Uh, The novel was from H.G. Wells. He has one acting credit on IMDb, but I was unable to locate a copy of 1924's They Forgot to Read the Directions, in which he plays a reverend. Mm. H.G. Wells plays a reverend in the movie. Among his many science fiction writing credits is George Millier's 1902 film A Trip to the Moon, Island of Lost Souls, The Invisible Man, War of the Worlds, The Island of Dr. Moreau, Empire of the Ants, along with all related remakes to any of those. Music here came from Russell Garcia. He also composed 36 Perry Masons, 14 episodes of The Untouchables, and a couple of Virginians. The, the show, not people from Virginia. <laughs> he just played music whenever they walked around. Fuck off, Russell. <laughs> Cinematographer Paul Vogel was the DP of first-person Marlowe film Lady in the Lake and Angels in the Outfield. Editor George Tomasini also cut Stalag 17, a whole bunch of Hitchcock like Rear Window, To Catch a Thief, The Man Who Knew Too Much, Vertigo, North by Northwest, Psycho, and previously for the podcast The Birds, which also starred Rod Taylor, who plays H. George Wells here. This was Taylor's first big starring role, and he kicked off the tradition of always casting Australians in the lead. All four time traveler actors... Taylor and Guy Pierce in the films, and Russell Napier and Mark Lee on television and stage, respectively, were all Australian. Hmm. The time traveler is always Australian. He was Sir David Carfee in Giant before this. He also voiced Pongo in 101 Dalmatians. Later, he shows up in Zabriskie Point, and most recently in his final role of Winston Churchill in Inglorious Bastards. Alan Young played David Philby and James Philby. This is an early credit for Young, but he followed it up the next year with his first of 144 appearances as Wilbur Post on the long-running Mr. Ed series. Missed opportunity. An early credit. A young credit for Young. (laughs) He did change his name (laughs) later in life. Young also shows up in The Cat from Outer Space and one of my favorite credits, 
voicing Disney's Scrooge McDuck for almost all appearances of the character, like including he did the voice for some of the like, the reboot series. Yeah, like House and like House of Mouse and things yeah. like that when he was still around because he lived for like almost a hundred, right? Yeah, he he just passed away uh, in the last couple years, right? Or yeah. 2016 or something. Yeah. Uh, um, he he also voices a fun character in uh, the third Monkey Island game. Okay, it's like yeah, it's just it's just a random character, but it, like uh, uh, it's just him doing his normal voice. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, he's also the only member of this cast who comes back to play a part in the 2002 remake as the proprietor of a flower shop. So uh, when he saves her life in the park, she doesn't get shot, and then he goes to a flower shop because he told her he'd bring flowers on their date. And while he's in the flower shop, she's standing outside and gets hit by a runaway horse and dies. So that's the guy selling him flowers is the Philby mm -hmm. actor. Yvette Mimieu played Weena. She's also Dr. Kate McRae in The Black Hole. She reunited with Rod Taylor in 1968's Dark of the Sun. Sebastian Cabot. Say Cabot. Cabot. We're moving right along. Footloose and fancy free. Get it? I get it. <laughs> I knew you would. Played Dr. Philip Hillier. He was a Capulet in 1954's Romeo and Juliet. Later, he has a lot of voice credits, like Sir Ector in The Sword in the Stone, Bagheera in The Jungle Book, and the narrator voice in a lot of Winnie the Pooh releases. He's also probably well known for playing Mr. Giles French in 130 episodes of Family Affair. Tom Helmore played Anthony Bridewell. He was Gavin Elster in Vertigo. Whit Bissell played Walter Kemp. He's a gate guard in The Seahawk. Dr. Edwin Thompson in Creature from the Black Lagoon, Lieutenant Dixon in The Cane Mutiny, Dr. Hill in the 56 Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Chamley in The Magnificent Seven, and he came back to play Ralph Branley in the 1978 Time Machine TV movie. We just had him pretty recently as Mayor Santini in Soylent Green. Really wanted to say Soylent Greeny, but I didn't do it. Doris Lloyd played Mrs. Watch. I guess I did do it. <laughs> Doris Lloyd played Mrs. Watchett. She was Baroness Eberfield in The Sound of Music, and she's the voice of the Rose in Alice in Wonderland. She's also uncredited as Depositor in Mary Poppins. I don't oh, okay. Know. Who's yeah. the Depositor? Oh, well, uh, when there's a run on the bank. Um, oh, okay. And all she's one of the people, people freaking like out. They want their money. Yeah. yeah. Paul Fries is the voice of the Talking Rings. He's voice acting royalty. He's the narrator of the Droopy Dog cartoons. He's the English ADR for a lot of kaiju films. He also does voices on Mr. Magoo, The Dick Tracy Show, The Flintstones, Space Ghost, the original Space Ghost, not Coast to Coast. We heard him last narrating The Manchurian Candidate. He's Boris Badnov on The Bullwinkle Show. He's Barnyard Horse in Mary Poppins. And I never won't bring up that he's the voice of Disneyland's Haunted Mansion. Is this haunted room actually stretching? I think that's everything for the time machine. Thanks again to Carlos Moda for their generous contribution to the show. If you have any thoughts you'd like to share, you can find our socials at linktree slash vintage video pod. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing whatever you chose. We leave you now with the trailer for the time machine. Such stories as H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds and Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea have challenged mankind. So today, man is successfully probing deep into the mysteries of the universe. Can he penetrate the greatest mystery of all, time itself? magic of George Pal and the fabulous production know-how of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer to catapult you through time into a world that is yet to be. Why is it that we usually ignore the fourth dimension? You, you see, we can move in the other three. As the doctor said, up, down, forwards, backwards, sideways. But when it comes to time, we are prisoners. Inventor Rod Taylor's breakthrough into the realm of the fourth dimension is defied by his friend Alan Young. If that machine can do what you say it can, Destroy it, George, before it destroys you. Every moment is a year, hurtling through the atomic wars of the future on an incredible excursion into the unknown. What are the people like? Ah, <laughs> the shape of things to come. It's lovely Yvette Mimieu. And what happens when boy meets girl thousands of years hence? How do they wear their hair? Who? The women of your time. Up like that? Show me.
Is this the human race of the future? Or is this the Morlocks, fiendish creatures who live in a weird underground world? And the Eloi, the tranquil sunshine people, who the Morlocks dominate and maintain like cattle, luring them below with the hypnotic wail of the sirens to feed upon them in cannibalistic horror. <laughs> 